Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm not thanking the organizer for inviting me because I somewhat self-invited myself <laughs> to give this uh, uh, introductory lecture. So uh, as you've heard, uh, my background is in, uh, is in physics or so, uh, mainly st statistical physics. Um, and uh, definitely material science. And, and since uh, now six, seven years, I've been busy with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but today I will not mention too much the, the activities we had in, uh, in, in my group uh, in, the Nomad, in the Nomad laboratory uh, about artificial intelligence method that we have been developing. I will try to give a broad overview of uh, artificial intelligence ideas and challenges. Uh, having in mind that we are, we, we all care about material science, so the application is towards material science, but I will be quite uh, broad. Um, so the idea is that uh, I, um, yeah, after a little bit of rethinking, um, I go straight until uh, more or less 2 p.m., but feel free to interrupt uh, any moment, or maybe if I see that so there is no interaction whatsoever, maybe I ask questions. <laughs> That means uh, that by, so in, in the room, just raise your hand physically and, and via Zoom, uh, uh, raise your hand uh, uh, virtually and uh, somebody will prompt me to um, uh, have your question pass through. Um, okay, uh, I think that's what I wanted to say before starting. And as you will see, uh, I will um, insist uh, uh, mainly on terminology, but not in the sense that the terminology should be binding, but just to try and understand each other, because uh, if you have already approached artificial intelligence by many different directions, maybe uh, it's sometimes confusing because people are naming things uh, uh, differently or they're naming different things with the same name. Uh, so I will give a, a suggestion on how to name things just to try have a common vocabulary uh, for the uh, for this school at least. Um, yeah, so uh, about taxonomy or terminology, um, I like to start with the, the term itself, artificial intelligence, that in itself is a little bit sometimes uh, misunderstood. Um, um, in general, we have um, two um, um, types uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and we have what we, we call the uh, narrow um, artificial intelligence and the general artificial intelligence. And sometimes probably when we say artificial intelligence, we have more in mind uh, the, the, the general one. Uh, the, uh, the narrow uh, kind of artificial intelligence would be, uh, uh, can be defined as the theory and the development of computer systems, so the actual implementation, that perform tasks normally associated to human intelligence. So anything that tries to mimic human intelligence falls into artificial intelligence, even if it is a specific task. Um, like uh, perceiving, classifying, learning, abstracting, reasoning, and or acting when you really have some kind of a robot that, that does something in the material space. Um, so um, a little bit of uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, underlying on, on, the, on the term learning that will come later, uh, try to, to explain what uh, learning means. Um, and, uh, and then yes, these are typical kind of uh, tasks that uh, we associate to human intelligence and that in the history of artificial intelligence has been trying to uh, be mimicked by uh, algorithms. And then we have the general AI, very, very uh, short. Uh, it's the full aut autonomous uh, artificial intelligence that essentially uh, would be able to do anything uh, similar to uh, uh, a human, but hopefully uh, faster and better, because otherwise would be no point. Um, and for that, I will, I will not really uh, talk about, about uh, general AI too much. I, I like to uh, defer people to uh, a very nice uh, podcast. Uh, I, I hope most of you know Lex Friedman uh, podcast. If you don't, uh, 
just go there in general. But number 103 is with Ben Gerstel, and he's one of the gurus of uh, general AI. I think uh, it's uh, very thought-provoking. It's quite long. It's like three and more hours, but uh, I mean, relaxed. Uh, in, in, in some evenings, uh, you will have a lot of uh, uh, thoughts for, for your brain about uh, general AI, what it is now, uh, where it's going, and what we would like that to do and what we wouldn't like that to do. Um, next, uh, I introduce my uh, favorite animal, that is the platypus, <laughs> because I will be doing a lot of uh, classifications, and, uh, and most of them, they are slightly contradicting. And the platypus, I guess, I hope you know, is a strange mammal that has a duck uh, beak, uh, lays eggs, uh, but it's still a mammal. <laughs> so it's, it's normally the nightmare of taxonomists. Um, uh, and so I, I like to have it there to remind that uh, all the taxonomy that I'm doing uh, is not to be uh, taken as, uh, as um, uh, strict. Um, now I would like to do a little bit of history um, of, uh, of artificial intelligence that also helps understanding um, um, what people are talking about essentially when, when they uh, talk about artificial intelligence. Um, so, um, as, well, I, I, I took this other, you will see a lot of uh, mentioning of YouTube videos because I think uh, uh, it is a very good source uh, uh, in general. I mean, not YouTube in general. It's just that you find a lot of uh, very inspiring videos uh, where people uh, talk about uh, uh, AI in general. So this is uh, uh, a guy from DARPA um, that uh, has been in, in the business for quite a while and tries to uh, uh, tell the history of artificial intelligence. So there is a, an initial um, kind of um, part of artificial intelligence that it was when people were trying to code uh, algorithm that uh, based on essentially extended if then rules, trying to predict everything that could happen from the point of view of perception and what the, the machine would do. Uh, today, we would hardly call that artificial intelligence. And as you see in this uh, um, kind of ruler here, uh, it, it was about perceiving. So there was some kind of sensor. Um, and the reasoning was essentially predetermined by the humans that were programming. So uh, it, it, some signal is bigger than, and the other signal is lower than, and then, okay, do this, and then so on and so forth. And this would, was already uh, programming robots that would do uh, rather complex uh, uh, operations. It's also some kind of vision in some sense, in some cases. But uh, you see that learning and abstracting is, uh, is to zero. So the, 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 the machines were not learning. Um, and uh, And, Abstracting is related to the fact that would they understand in some sense a representation of the world such that they could apply similar uh, uh, algorithms, similar uh, um, yeah, tasks to, to, to different uh, uh, scenarios. So the, 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 the old era was completely without learning and abstracting. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, okay, a common plot that, uh, uh, that's why it's called uh, waves. Uh, they were the, the, in, in the past, there were already periods in which people had a lot of expectation about uh, artificial intelligence. They financed a lot of, of activities, and then uh, essentially too little was delivered, and so the, they were so-called uh, winter AI winter winters. Uh, people identify two winters. Um, and apparently now we are on a kind of a spring or, or, well, I think still spring, not, 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 not yet summer. Uh, and um, in, in fostered by essentially deep learning uh, starting uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, so the, the second wave uh, would be what we are living today. Uh, that is uh, statistical learning uh, where you see that um, you have uh, uh, perceiving uh, again, so the fact that you uh, start from data uh, and the learning uh, uh, that is uh, really happening. A um, uh, little reasoning that means that, that the um, uh, algorithms uh, essentially map the, the input into some kind of uh, action uh, or output, uh, but um, doesn't do what uh, we recognize as reasoning uh, from um, human perspective and also the abstraction is a little bit but but not very much this opens the uh, way to the future actually and and what uh, uh, artificial intelligence developer call contextual adaptation 
So algorithms uh, that really um, now uh, reason and 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 tries to do uh, try to do uh, abstraction. So this is, as I said, the, the future, and and there is already some research in what is called neural symbolic learning and reasoning. So essentially, it's the idea to combine deep learning and. By the end of the school, you will know quite well what deep learning is. I will say very little today. Um, and, uh, and symbolic learning, because we think that the human uh, uh, understanding goes through uh, symbolic learning. So we try to assign uh, essentially symbols to uh, uh, the reality that we perceive, uh, even understanding objects that, that we see is, is, is a, some kind of symbolism because we have the concept of some uh, objects that are uh, always present and they change uh, in the environment. Okay, so this is about the, the history. Um, and uh, uh, another, um, uh, not another, a very useful, uh, but not very usual, classification that uh, we can do about artificial intelligence uh, uh, methods um, is uh, a distinction between what we call confirmatory analysis or some people call uh, confirmatory analysis and something else that will come later <laughs> in, the, in the other half of the slide. Um, so I, I assume that uh, most of us when talking about artificial intelligence have in mind this confirmatory analysis that is also called uh, predictive induction. It is basically, we have data that have labels, so, uh, uh, and we try to predict the labels. So we, we, um, we already know the answer of the training data, so we know what, what they uh, produce, uh, and we want the machine to infer um, uh, the rule that, that connects the, the, uh, the representation, I will come to representation in a second, and uh, the labels. Uh, so this is the usual um, kind of uh, uh, learning algorithm that we have in mind typically. Uh, a much less visited, unless in, uh, uh, in a very intuitive way, is the exploratory analysis that is called also descriptive induction. So you still, uh, the, uh, the algorithm will still find rules, uh, but it gives description of the data, not a prediction. Um, and uh, I quoted uh, John Taki that uh, was I mean, famous statisticians of, of the 20th century said uh, um, in this regard, finding the question is often more important than finding the answer in the sense that uh, um, we, yeah, I mean, I think it's self-explaining uh, 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 little sentence that I think has a, a deep insight. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to talk about actual methods uh, in the predictive induction, you would have uh, the good old regression when you try to predict uh, numbers, <laughs> essentially, and classification when you try to assign a class uh, to uh, a set of uh, data. Um, and in the exploratory part, you have uh, uh, what people call clustering and dimension reduction. I will flesh a little bit the concepts uh, later. And this afternoon in the, in the hands-on session, there will be a little bit of uh, this dimension reduction and clustering. It's a very nice uh, tool for uh, exploring the data. And something that's called subgroup discovery. That is something we developed in my group, but uh, I will not essentially talk about this today. Um, so there are methods for, for doing uh, 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 this so-called descriptive induction, in which rather than try to predict numbers or, or, or classes, we, we, we just try to understand how the data are structured in themselves uh, in order to get some hints. Okay, uh, slowly getting to uh, more technicalities of artificial intelligence. Um, and, and then I, I, I go to the next uh, level. Uh, so a subset of artificial intelligence is what is called machine learning. So this is also to clarify a little bit. They are almost synonyms, uh, but not exactly the same. Uh, in, in machine learning, we need that the learning algorithm, so the algorithm is learning. And learning from a, from an algorithmic point of view, it means that this uh, uh, algorithm is uh, giving as an output a model, a predictive model, and this has to strictly improve with more data. So this is uh, the essence of learning. 
And as I will show a little bit later, I mean, not demonstrate, just, just a little bit uh, show, uh, is uh, this uh, um, is mathematically enacted by uh, the so-called regularized regression. I will explain what this means. And um, uh, um, we have also type of machine learning algorithms. Uh, a type is a supervised learning where we uh, predict uh, uh, labels. Then we have unsupervised learning, that is uh, 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 finding structure in the data. So it's a little bit like as I, 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 in, in the previous classification where we have um, um, the predictive uh, and descriptive induction, but they are slightly uh, different here, the, the, the classes. For example, here we have another class of algorithm is called reinforcement learning that is specifically designed uh, to learn from few initial data, sometimes even uh, one initial uh, data point, and uh, a kind of uh, uh, red line of this uh, school is uh, what to do when we have few data, because in material science, it is a kind of the most likely scenario where we have a very few data when, uh, to start from. Um, and uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it is uh, very uh, important to focus on the situation where we have uh, small data. And in, in textbook, you will find that uh, reinforcement learning is neither supervised nor unsupervised, so we have a different class. So just to, to put it in, in context. Okay. Um, now, uh, a different aspect of the um of the kind of uh, um, topic that we deal in this school is the um the big data part right so we have uh, uh, artificial intelligence but people talk a lot also about big data and this comes uh, the idea of big data uh, i mean it has been formalized recognized uh now what is that 15 years ago in a um, Microsoft uh, conference by Jim Gray. And, and the idea was that he proposed that uh, uh, big data is a, a new paradigm in science, uh, saying that, so elaborating that uh, uh, you have an, the original paradigm of science, that uh, the science is purely empirical uh, observation and, and experiments, try to understand a little bit what's going on in nature. Um, the first uh, great revolution was the introduction of uh, scientific method, uh, where we started having the uh, um, dialogue between theory and uh, an experiment. Um, and, um, and then, uh, according to almost everybody at the moment, even though it took a while to, to, to reach the agreement, the consensus uh, is that at some point, uh, at the second half of the uh, last century, uh, we have the introduction of, uh, introduction of a new paradigm that is computational science. So essentially, we have computers that simulate a uh, system and give answer that uh, cannot be derived by simple, uh, you know, uh, pencil and paper uh, analysis of uh, physical model models. But at the end of the day, the models were from humans. They were just uh, uh, implemented in, in computers to give new results. So we have systems that can be described by laws written by humans, uh, but they, we, we, we have hard time in understanding what's going on in, the, in a specific system and, and we have to simulate it. So this is uh, computational science. Uh, the next uh, level, the next evolution is uh, uh, when uh, uh, we ask uh, uh, the computers also to find the models, right? So from the data, uh, we just have uh, uh, input um, uh, also uh, about the, the possible models for, from, uh, from computers. Um, and now uh, in, in, in some discussions that, that, that uh, were in the, in the normal laboratories and, and, and more recently in, in, in Fermat, uh, uh, people started criticizing a little bit uh, the, the, the fact that uh, the, the being data driven is, is a new uh, uh, fact in, in, in physics. The idea is that uh, uh, science is by construction data driven. Uh, and to say that, imagine for example, that uh, uh, we know uh, the trajectories, trajectories of the planets in the, in the solar system, either from, uh, from experiment 
but also if we have a, a, a kind of a complicated uh, theory, very complex uh, theory, complex and complicated at the same time, um, uh, but for, from which we uh, find uh, uh, trajectories of, of the planets in the, in the solar system. And then by analyzing the data, somebody can find that if you put uh, uh, orbital period squared on one axis, and, uh, and uh, the major semi-axis of the orbit uh, cubed uh, on the other axis, all the orbits fall on a, on a, on a straight line. So this is a, a purely data-driven uh, uh, relationship that one can find. And, and, and uh, uh, humans have been doing this over and over in, in the course of science. Uh, so uh, saying that, that now we have data-driven science uh, is a little bit of a... Uh, um, yeah, uh, anti-historical uh, statement. Um, and exactly, so typically what we had in, in, uh, in, uh, in history, uh, we always, uh, we typically start from data. Then we have some kind of uh, what we today call statistical learning. It could be done by, by a human. Uh, in this particular case, we go from the data collected by uh, Tycho Brahe uh, and, and, and then analyzed by, by Johannes Kepler that finds this law. And then uh, this uh, sinks into a physical law. Uh, in this particular case, would be uh, gravitational laws from uh, uh, Isaac Newton, that are uh, a little bit more general empirical rules, right? I mean, um, um, th th there is a lot of discussion on how much the, the models that, that come from machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, are physically relevant. Um, uh, and typically, the, the discussion, I will come back uh, at the end in, in uh, the, this topic that is called interpretability, is the idea whether we can find something that uh, governs all uh, the empirical rules that have been found. In this particular case, uh, we, we have the physical uh, laws from uh, um, gravitation and, and in general mechanics, and then we are happy and uh, uh, from, uh, from a conceptual point of view, uh, because a uh, few laws about mechanics and, and just uh, uh, um, a description on how gravitational force uh, interaction works, we can derive the orbit of the planets. Uh, but also that is empirical, right? I mean, mechanics works like that, uh, uh, and we are happy, and the, uh, we have conservation of angular momentum, and we are very happy, but this is empirical. We could be in a universe where this is not true, and we need to get this from, from, uh, from the data. Uh, it, uh, itself. Uh, the other uh, typical example of uh, data-driven science is uh, Mendeleev's uh, periodic table. I always like to put, uh, this is not really the first uh, uh, edition, it's the second edition of a Mendeleev original table, just to show uh, uh, the insight that, that Mendeleev had. So he, he was putting um, elements known uh, at that time in 1871, what is the course? Okay. Um, uh, uh, grouped by uh, the stoichiometry of reaction with oxygen and, uh, and hydrogen, um, and then ordered by uh, the, the weight, the atomic weight. At that time, they, they knew uh, atomic weight. Of course, they didn't, Mendeleev and, and, and anybody at, at that time knew anything about atomic number. Uh, but still, um, uh, Mendeleev, uh, could, could draw a, a periodic table that is uh, stunningly similar to, to the modern one. But what I, uh, I and many people really like about uh, this, this table is that it's predictive. There are empty slots. So uh, Mendeleev say that there must be an element here that we have not yet seen. So two elements, for example, there. And, and then uh, someday, a few, 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 few years later, actually, I think in the lifetime of Mendeleev, people, for example, there found gallium and germanium uh, in, the, in the empty slot. So purely data-driven, no understanding of quantum mechanics and uh, atomic theory uh, as we have now, and, and then people can predict uh, missing um, um, yeah, elements and, and, and so something that is not on the table. Um, so uh, the proposal here is to shift a little bit the terminology to data-centric uh, science rather than uh, data-driven, uh, because again, the idea is that uh, it, it, it has been always uh, data-driven and, and it's always, it always should be uh, data-driven, 
uh, when we talk about uh, empirical sciences. Um, but if we change a little bit the terminology to data centric, as proposed in the paper by other essentially the fair math uh, uh, PIs, uh, we uh, kind of uh, uh, specify what is new, right? Uh, that, 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 that we uh, squeeze everything out of, 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 the, of the data, uh, from the data in, uh, in, uh, uh, using artificial intelligence. Uh, and then we think if we have to, to do something more uh, from a human point of view. Um, and now to uh, kind of, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, underline that um, uh, really data uh, and, and, and having a lot of data available uh, uh, triggers uh, uh, conceptual revolution. Uh, I propose this table, also that suggested in some uh, uh, nice talks that I watched on YouTube, uh, where the idea is that uh, we have had some uh, uh, interesting breakthrough in, in artificial intelligence in the, in the years. I guess everybody remembers uh, Google's DeepMind uh, with the, well, this is the Atari games, not the, the, the Go thing, but uh, 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 these are a kind of short list of uh, um, a breakthrough in, uh, in, uh, in AI. And the interesting observation is that uh, this breakthrough came few years, uh, so very short time after uh, data for the learning uh, were available, not uh, after the algorithm were first proposed. So some, some mathematicians, some uh, computer scientists that develop some, some algorithm, everybody's happy, they, they get citations, uh, but nobody cares <laughs> in, in, the, in the real world uh, until uh, somebody uh, finds data to train the machine, and then uh, uh, all of a sudden the, 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 the breakthrough is on uh, all uh, newspapers. So um, data is really uh, what is making the, uh, the, the revolution happen. And so uh, in practice, uh, statistical learning has essentially always this uh, logical flow chart. It starts from data, but then I put something, annotated data, and then I say a little bit about uh, data notation um, in, in the next slides, uh, but, but Marcus will uh, 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 dig uh, much more into, into that, uh, in particular, how we interpret this uh, uh, need and, and power of annotated data in, uh, in Fermat in the normal laboratory. So we have the data that have to be somewhat clean <laughs> in some sense. I, I will come back in a, in a second. Um, and then we need to uh, represent uh, our data in a way that is suitable for the statistical learning to happen. And this is the topic of featureization, uh, creation of descriptors and representations. And I will try also to uh, disentangle a little bit the terminology here. Um, then we need uh, training algorithms. So basically this is uh, what would be the core of, 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 of the matter when one starts going through, you know, deep learning, uh, uh, tree regression and, 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 and some kind of other kind of regression. I will not do that. And in this uh, school, you will see some specific methods uh, we didn't try to be uh, exhaustive for that you need a full uh, course, uh, but I hope you will get uh, uh, the, the, the most important uh, um, kind of message here. And I will try also to point at uh, what is common uh, uh, among all methods. Uh, the important thing in, in the training, uh, because at the end of the day, one trains parameters of, of the algorithms and uh, hyperparameter, so we try to say what this is, is this, um, is to define uh, how we say that certain algorithm is better than another one, so we have the problem uh, or the challenge of uh, training metrics. Now, uh, in, the, in, in the past years, uh, we, um, in terms of uh, normal laboratory, uh, we have given a full uh, course that is uh, on, on artificial intelligence um, with a companion uh, uh, hands-on uh, notebooks, and this can all be found uh, uh, online. I suppose that we will share the slides, so I don't think you have to uh, 
uh, uh, hurry and, and look for the material now. Uh, but the idea is that uh, uh, if you still uh, miss some, some, something from, from this school, uh, there is a full uh, course in terms of uh, videos and uh, hands-on material um, uh, uh, extra to, to, to what we have, uh, what we present here at this school. Um, then um, going through this uh, logical flow chart, uh, we have the important part of uh, the model selection. So we'll start from a type of machine learning and then train cyber parameters. But at some point, one is to define exactly which will be the predictive model to be used with new data uh, and, and, and predict uh, something, uh, something new. And this will, uh, uh, will be connected to the so-called uh, uh, cross-validation that I will touch uh, briefly later. And then at the end of the day, uh, we have to test on real data and assess how uh, the model is good on, uh, with real data. Um, so now a few uh, words about uh, uh, annotated data. So uh, as I said, uh, Marcus will be much more specific here, uh, but um, uh, uh, the um, so-called FAIR uh, concept of, uh, of data uh, storage and, and uh, uh, stewardship uh, has been kind of uh, expressed in a, in, in, a, in a paper in 2016, I think. Uh, the NOMAD uh, laboratory essentially had already implemented this, these ideas uh, in, in the late 2014, in some sense. Um, actually, by, by all means. Uh, so what, what are these fair? Uh, yeah, I didn't put them in explicitly, but by now I think you all know uh, these are the traditional symbols. Uh, the, the data have to be uh, findable and accessible. They sound like synonyms, but uh, uh, they are not exactly the same. So one has to be able to uh, um, find if there are data uh, and where they are, and then uh, to uh, uh, technically access them. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, the I is for interoperability and the R is for, say, reusability. Um, and this is uh, the important part where one uh, stores the data um, that can be found uh, uh, at a later stage, but in particular, they can be found for uh, reasons that are different from the original uh, reason they were uh, um, uh, produced. Uh, and this would be uh, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, necessary condition uh, to uh, utilize data uh, in a kind of uh, global way so that uh, everybody uh, contributes to some kind of uh, large storage of, uh, of data and people can benefit uh, from, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, common um, uh, storage, if not uh, uh, knowledge yet. Um, and so the way this was implemented in the normal uh, laboratory uh, uh, originally, and, uh, and for the main part so far, it is about uh, computational data and, and in particular, from um, uh, ab initio kind of calculations. So back then we identified uh, a certain number of uh, ab initio codes and, and we require people to um, upload in, the, in what we call the repository, the, uh, the raw input and output. So the idea is that they didn't upload tables where you say data points and then few uh, processed, post-processed uh, information. It's really since you're using uh, a code that has a lot of information, uh, you just uh, dump the whole information. And then we, we ourselves post-process the data and map them in what we call, um, so what it is a metadata schema. And just to give the flavor for, for the particular case of uh, atomistic codes, if one thinks that the code has some kind of, uh, well, description of the code itself, some kind of uh, description of the system that has been inv investigated and some kind of the description of the physical model and numerical model that is used in the code and some kind of output. So basically, if you uh, think that the output is the actual data, everything else that describes the data tells how the data were produced are the metadata to this data. Um, and this is uh, the um, kind of um, uh, requirement uh, in order to be able to use data at a later uh, time if you were not the person that did the calculations and you want to um, 
kind of uh, um, use the data for, for training some kind of uh, um, uh, machine learning artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. Uh, of course, you would need also some uh, uh, so-called administrative metadata. Maybe you want to know who did the calculation, when, and, and, and where they are. Uh, but uh, the, the main thing of the codes, uh, the missing simulation codes would be this kind of information uh, from, from, from the calculation itself. And this would be mapped into very schematic view of the uh, metadata schema that we have uh, in the in the in the normal laboratory and again uh, marcus will really talk extensively about this and, and and much more because this is just the computational data but this is what we have been having for quite a long time um okay um and this is about the um the necessity and and and, uh, and to, to to have annotated data and uh, how we are building this uh, for computational material science in the context of the uh, Fermat. Um, next thing, we need to um, discuss how to actually um, represent uh, this data in order that one can train a machine learning uh, algorithm. And uh, uh, now slowly, we, we, we are getting there. Um, first of all, I have to discuss a different type of uh, uh, variables than one can uh, have uh, in the in the description and as target uh, uh, of of a learning procedure. So you, I already mentioned that you have a, a regression as a type of learning um, that is uh, then uh, some kind of quantitative uh, kind of learning. And but even there, you could have uh, discrete variables that you want to learn and continuous variable that you want to learn. Uh, in the continuous variable, you could have uh, scalars, but also uh, bigger, uh, so uh, higher dimensional objects. And in particular, if you want to learn uh, higher dimensional uh, objects, entities, uh, you may want that your learning algorithm knows that they are vectors, if they are vectors, or they are, they are tensor, if they are tensor, in particular, they need to obey some transformation rules that are typical of vectors and and, and tensors, and you may want your algorithm. So the initial part of the design of an artificial intelligence method is really to know what you're looking for um, and, and then adapt the, the methodology to the type of, um, of data. You may have also categorical uh, uh, kind of variables um, and, and where they may have a number uh, associated to them, but it, it is not uh, meaningful that it is a specific value. Uh, so this is typically the classification uh, kind of uh, uh, learning that could be just two classes, yes, no, um, but it could be anything uh, with, with the name. So yeah, the typical thing is the image interpretation when you want to describe what, what it is there uh, in, the, in the image. And if you dig a little bit into literature, you find that um, as back as in 1946, uh, uh, people have been thinking about what could be the, the, the type of variables that, that uh, one learns. And this is, uh, I mean, um, it is useful to know this kind of um, uh, um, reasoning uh, because sometimes uh, it, it um, guides you in, uh, in, in designing the artificial intelligence algorithm uh, that, that you want to use. Um, because uh, you, you could have, um, you, you, you could try to learn uh, nominal labels. There could be order, like, like one, two, three, four, five, but they have, the, the, the order has no meaning. So this is typical classification scenario in which you have just uh, categories. Uh, then you could have uh, a, a rank that you want to, to learn. So you would have now one, two, three, four, five, where the order has a meaning, but the fact that one and is, is, is the same distance to two, then, then two to three has no meaning. So they, you just know that one comes before two and two comes before three. This is trivial if you think about, but sometimes knowing that you want just the rank and not a specific value is uh, uh, important in designing your algorithm. Uh, then you would have uh, uh, the, 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 the next uh, level would be uh, learning uh, uh, interval kind of uh, values where you have uh, now discrete um, continuous values um, 
but with a, an arbitrary zero. So you, you, you just uh, um, exactly know the distance between them, the, the ranking, uh, uh, so the, the, the bigger than, lower than kind of uh, uh, relationship, but it could be that, that the zero has no uh, actual meaning, so that, that there is an arbitrary uh, zero. And then you would have uh, the physical, uh, uh, most of the physical uh, uh, quantities that are ratios, so because they are related to a, a unit. And the unit part is, uh, uh, looks like a, a tiny detail, uh, but when you are uh, storing uh, data and you want to reuse them, knowing exactly what unit was used and, and convert among unit is not the, the, the most trivial problem. So um, one has to keep in mind that, uh, physical quantities as units uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a procedural um, sense. And then you would have uh, yeah, the, the cardinal kind of variables that uh, um, um, uh, you, you, you just have, uh, so you say how many uh, of something you, 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 you would have. And, and nicely here would be the only one that you could do either a classification or, or, or a regression because you could do a regression when you predict the value, but then you just say, okay, only the integer part uh, uh, is meaningful, but you could also have a classification in which you just uh, 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 learn each number in a, as, as a classification. Um, now I want to uh, discuss a little bit, uh, uh, a little the, the jungle terminology in uh, with, with features, descriptors and, uh, and, and, and similar things. Uh, there is, um, I've noticed that, that, that uh, uh, these terms, features, descriptor, and the next one, representation, is uh, uh, often uh, confused uh, because different authors uh, use them in a, in a different way. Here, in, the, in this uh, um, um, kind of uh, schema that I will try to make it clear, uh, this is the clearest way I found to, to, to discuss these things. Um, I try to make some order. So essentially, we start from uh, uh, the, 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 the real elementary primary features that one plugs in that could be uh, the, 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 the atomic number of chemical elements that we have in our uh, materials uh, or the uh, coordinates if we have them. Uh, explicit, uh, so some kind of uh, uh, raw information that we get from uh, from our uh, say measurement or, or or whatever system we we try to uh, look for, um, and 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 then we already construct nope, the other direction uh, features on top of these uh, elementary features, uh, right? So um, we already have functions of these uh, uh, elementary or primary features uh, that directly enter um, uh, our um, learning algorithm. And these are called features, right? You see that the schema is always the same. I, I say uh, that the features uh, so the feature is a function of primary feature, and then you have another feature that is also fine of other primary features, and all together uh, are input to another function. In this case, the, the, the function we call it descriptor. So when, when you combine features, we get a descriptor. Typically, a descriptor is a multidimensional object. Uh, typically, a feature is a scalar object, but doesn't need uh, specifically to be. Uh, but in any case, the descriptor is almost always a, a multidimensional uh, object that is uh, um, an array of features. Now, uh, these uh, different descriptors could be combined uh, in, yes, in um, uh, a representation. Now, technically, the representation is the actual uh, input that uh, a machine learning model is using. Uh, to predict the result. Uh, so basically, everything that happens before could be done uh, manually by humans, that when you, when you const construct the representation by combining features and descriptors, or it could be done as part of the learning itself, as I will tell in the in in next slide, essentially. Um, now, different representation together are the input of a, a, a learned model. And 
more than one model can uh, predict the property. Why I have still the fact that the property is, 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 uh, is a function of more than one model. There is a, something in machine learning that is um, ensemble learning that is becoming bigger and bigger th these days, in which you train different models that try to be as uncorrelated as, as possible and, and putting them together, you get a, a prediction of, of your quantity. So all these uh, uh, layered representation tries to make a little bit of uh, uh, order in all this terminology. Uh, this is not something that everybody would agree on, but uh, putting together different things that can be found in literature, uh, this is a fair uh, um, middle point uh, among different uh, terminologies. Um, so the representation uh, thing is, is, is so important that uh, uh, people recently have thought that, that we have a, a part of uh, uh, machine learning that is actually called representation learning. So there is a, a subset uh, of very powerful algorithms uh, that learn a representation together with the model itself. Uh, the famous one is deep learning. So deep, the deep learning via neural networks, uh, the, what the neural network use uh, uh, effectively as input is some kind of a function of the actual input that is given uh, by, by, by us, by, by, by the humans. So there is a, an internal representation that is not always easy to uh, extract, but it is the actual uh, input that is used in order to make predictions. Uh, another class of, of, of this uh, 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 representation learning algorithm is symbolic regression. And this is another thing I'm uh, working uh, actively on. Um, and it seems that, uh, as I mentioned a few slides ago, uh, the two uh, uh, areas are converging in this uh, uh, kind of symbolic uh, deep learning in which uh, uh, the, the neural network tries to learn uh, yeah, symbolic uh, expression that in this particular case would be really a uh, mathematical expression that we can somewhat uh, interpret. Okay, now I want to focus a little bit uh, uh, on the descriptor. Um, and, and, and this paper here uh, uh, in 2020, uh, people tried to uh, lay down the um, rules for a descriptor uh, that is good uh, uh, thinking in particular at material science. As you will see, uh, the, it is a little bit biased towards um, descriptors for uh, uh, configurations, atomic configurations, in order to predict uh, uh, observables of that particular atomic configurations, but it can be easily generalized or with some care can be generalized to more general descriptors for material science. So, First of all, the descriptor should already carry uh, a lot of information about the physical uh, reality. Uh, one is invariance. Uh, so especially if you're representing uh, things that are intrinsically uh, vectors or tensors, um, we should have uh, the same symmetries that we have uh, in the, um, in the, um, in the physical system. Um, uh, then there is something about sensitivity or local stability. So when we change a little bit uh, the descriptor, if you think about atoms, uh, if you move a little bit the atoms, uh, we, we would have uh, small changes also in the descriptor if the descriptor reacts uh, too quickly at small uh, perturbations in, in, in the input system. Uh, then the learning algorithm would have hard time because it has to balance some kind of uh, instability in the input itself, so right? So you would have some kind of chaotic input. Uh, imagine that you have to learn a, a stable uh, uh, law out of that uh, uh, unstable input. Uh, better if we are even differentiable uh, with respect to changes in um, uh, among the degrees of freedom that we have in our uh, description of the system. Uh, and then there is a, an important point that is, uh, I, I will come to that in, in the next few slides, about global uniqueness. That is obvious if you, if you write down the rules, it's by far not obvious to prove that your descriptor is uh, uh, unique. So the idea is that uh, 
um, you have an injective mapping. So whenever you have a, a system or something that you want to, to predict something out of it, um, you map uniquely into, into your descriptor. But this is, um, um, okay, I will come back uh, to this. Um, then we want uh, some kind of uh, Occam razor. Uh, we want the dimensionality of the descriptor is as, as small as, uh, as possible, but not smaller. <laughs> and um, uh, then we also would like that uh, it's it easy to calculate the descriptor uh, from, from the data, right? If you have a super involved uh, machinery in order to evaluate the descriptor from your input uh, features, uh, then you may want to, to think if you can uh, speed up uh, in, in, some, uh, in some way. Um, yeah, this is connected. Uh, scalability and complexity are... Uh, are uh, ah, no, sorry, I, I think I mixed up. <laughs> yes, so the complexity is what I said uh, before. The scalability is, is the fact that the, the descriptor has to be usable for uh, all instances of the system. So if you change the number of atoms, if you, if you change something in your system, your, your descriptor should, should be uh, valid for all uh, possible instances of your system. Uh, last point that I will come back at the end of the lecture is uh, interpretability. Uh, that is the fact that we would like to understand uh, and possibly to communicate what the descriptor means. And this is a very delicate point that uh, uh, should not be um, kind of uh, uh, underestimated. Um, so just to show a little bit how people have been creative with descriptors, I, I, I make two examples in, in material science. So uh, uh, kind of, uh, so it's pretty, uh, oh, it's becoming to, to be 10 years old. Uh, uh, okay, interesting. Uh, publication by Rampi Ramprasad, one of the pioneers in, uh, in machine learning for material science. Um, uh, in, the, in this publication, they wanted to represent uh, 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 block uh, polymers. So essentially they have uh, uh, possible polymers made by these uh, uh, units, CH2, uh, silicon fluoride and so on. Um, and then they used uh, uh, a 20 dimensional uh, uh, object that counting how many times uh, each of these building block would appear, how many time a certain type of pair would appear, and how many times uh, a certain kind of triplet uh, uh, would appear. So, like if you if you write down uh, the polymer as a, as, a, as a word with, with with letters, you just look at some kind of correlation among the letters in the in, in the word. And this was uh, a kind of a, mm, very successful descriptor for this kind of system. So, right, I mean, by far not not uh, the the first thing that you would think about. Uh, and, and then another very uh, imaginative descriptor. Um, this is a paper by 2015, the group of uh, Stefano Cuttarolo, uh, was the idea to map um, um, essentially, uh, uh, yeah, it's not very easy to see, but these are uh, electronic band structures and density of states uh, they are, that are mapped as, uh, as images, as uh, as. Uh, uh, essentially discretized images and, and the discretized images image is, is mapped into some kind of string uh, that, that is uh, uh, counting how many times you see a, a kind of dark spot in the in the image and this was used as an input to, to machine learning algorithm it was quite predictive for property of, uh, of a lot of uh, uh, different systems so um, these were uh, kind of uh, um, uh, original ideas uh, in terms of both uh, originality, but also uh, in the history of uh, uh, machine learning for material science that I always find uh, fascinating because they kind of triggered much more research. Um, okay. Now I will uh, spend some time um, on, uh, on talking about the, what we expect to find uh, in uh, supervised learning. And what are the uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, um, what is the terminology there in supervised learning, right? So first of all, we want to uh, find properties y that are a function of the input, and uh, and so we are looking for the function f. So we give the input, and we are looking uh, for the function f, and we accept 
that there is an error in the in this prediction because it's, it's, it's done statistically on the data. So this this uh, uh, x is the already the, the representation that enters. Uh, actually, it, it is the descriptor. Sorry, because the uh, actual function f could be a rearrangement of of the descriptor itself. So it could be a slightly different representation. Um, so the, the important guy here is the epsilon. So this error uh, is called irreducible error, is uh, everything that is not captured by, by the descriptor x. So this is something that you uh, need to remember that is always there. Uh, as long as you do a, a mapping uh, and a representation, uh, there will be something that is not captured by your descriptor. And so your uh, learn function uh, will not know about that, cannot know uh, uh, about that. And this enters uh, all your possible uh, uh, figures merit in, in evaluating the, uh, the, the model. So let's say that we have a, 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 a multilinear model, so it's just a linear combination of the features in the, in the, in the descriptor, uh, and you make your prediction, and then you um, define Exactly, it is a, a reducible and a reducible error. So the better your function f, the lower will be the prediction error, but the, you have this uh, irreducible part that is always there, and uh, um, you should not forget about it when you, when you analyze the thing. And this is related strictly to the global uniqueness point that I was uh, mentioning before. Um, the more you have into, into this epsilon, so what is not captured by the descriptor, the more your uniqueness is going to fail. So you will have a lot of uh, uh, input data, possibly, but you eventually will have, that will uh, map into the same descriptor. And this is a, a, an intrinsic source of error that is not so easy to uh, uh, disentangle uh, if you didn't think about. Okay. Uh, after you have done, uh, uh, you, you have determined the model and you make your prediction, you, um, you, you start making inference. So the, 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 the inferencing when you, when you start looking at the model and see, okay, what actually was used to make the model um, and what is the kind of relationship uh, and, and, uh, and uh, can we have it uh, more complex, like complex and so on. Um, and so in, the, in, in, in analyzing the quality of the fit, uh, we have to remember that we do it on uh, on uh, on the test data, not the, the training data, because we have used the training data to uh, fit the model. Uh, the test data that here are represented by these uh, uh, points here. So the different colors are the different kind of fits that we did um, on the, on on the same data. Uh, so the yellow would be a kind of simple model, and then you go a little bit more complex with the blue or probably a little bit black line for you. And, and then you have an even more complex model with this uh, uh, azure line. Um, and so what you have is that uh, uh, the error that you do on the training data tends to uh, get lower and lower, the more uh, uh, flexible is your training model. The flexibility is given by this uh, ability to wiggle. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the error that you do on the, on the data that were not used for, for, for fitting, um, it typically increases at some point uh, uh, when the model is, uh, uh, increases the complexity. And this is the, 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 the overfitting part of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the um, machine learning model, uh, where you have just used too complex uh, uh, model to, to fit your data. Of course, in this unidimensional cartoon thing, is easy to spot, but that is uh, in, 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 in general, one, one looks at these kind of diagrams and look for the uh, Goldilocks uh, spot where you have uh, the lowest test error. As you see here, you have your irreducible error. So when you evaluate the, the, the goodness of your, of your uh, machine learning model, uh, you, you have to be sure that so you have to remember that, that, that there will be some error that we we'll always be doing, and, and then your, uh, uh, you will get a minimum somewhere in which you want is, 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 uh, uh, is optimal, but maybe you are not happy because the, the total error here is, is, is much larger than what is meaningful for making any meaningful prediction. So then you have to think harder on your, on your descriptor, right? Um, so 
uh, in, the, in the theory of, of machine learning, uh, people show that your uh, error can be disentangled in two parts. Um, one that is uh, related to the data that is called uh, the variance, and the other one that is uh, uh, inherent to, to, to the model. So this, this so-called bias changes with the complexity of the model. This is just, again, terminology. If you ever find somebody talking about uh, bias uh, variance uh, trade-off, and the idea is that uh, your bias uh, is always uh, going down uh, when you, you increase the complexity of the model, and, and your variance is always uh, going up uh, because when you change the data, you would uh, have a, a different, uh, uh, so um, uh, your error will, will increase uh, the, the more complex is your model. And depending on the data, so this would be data that are fairly nonlinear, uh, you would need uh, a model that is uh, fairly nonlinear. If you have linear model, if you have data that are fit with linear models, they, uh, then it's better to fit them with, with linear uh, kind of models. Uh, and when you have, um, ah, okay, yeah, I wanted to make a small uh, uh, um, uh, kind of story about uh, do not underestimate a linear model. And the, the, the example I like the most is the Hubble uh, fit of uh, uh, distance versus uh, velocity of, of galaxies. This is the original uh, plot from, uh, from Hubble in 1929. I hope you know what, what you're talk I'm talking about, but uh, the idea is that uh, um, not only uh, all galaxies, essentially all galaxies, except those that are very close to us, are going away from us, uh, but the, the, the further they are, the, 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 the uh, faster they are moving in a linear way. So the, the is a, 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 there is a proposal uh, of um, linear relationship between the, the, the velocity and the distance. But now notice one thing. These are the data that Hubble had. Didn't put the, 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 uh, the error bars here. Not sure how, how big they were uh, estimated to be. The point is that you have uh, distances in megaparsec 0, 1, 2. So it's, it's a very narrow span. And Hubble was uh, brave enough to say, yeah, the linear fit, and I, from that I, I get uh, the, the, the constant. And uh, one of the constant is essentially the age of the universe. And he got a number that was not that bad. <laughs> and today we have a, a better linear fit that, that spans uh, 10 times uh, the order of magnitudes. We know why the, the Virgo cluster doesn't behave like the other. I don't want to, to enter that. I mean, they know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just read that they know. Um, but it's still a linear fit, right? And, and uh, one over this, uh, the, 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 the fitting uh, uh, co coefficient here is the age of the universe, uh, known up to 0. Point some, uh, one. Uh, millions of years, of course. They don't know exactly the date, but they will get <laughs> getting closer to that. And it seems it's not the same as the one on the Bible, but I don't want to, <laughs> to dig into that. OK, and then this was just a little bit of intermezzo on, on, on linearity of, uh, of data. When they are linear, please use linear models. When you think they are linear, so maybe you just try starting with linear models. And when the data are definitely nonlinear, uh, you, 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 you have to, to use more uh, complex uh, models. Um, okay, so uh, a little, uh, again, I'm going step by step into, into the, the, the several uh, steps of this uh, logical flow chart in, in machine learning, and we have to talk about uh, the typical uh, uh, learning matrix. When we are doing a regression, the typical learning matrix would be uh, the, the, the mean square error. That is what uh, shown in, in, in the previous slide. But when you have classification, uh, you have to invent something new and, and, and like kind of naive uh, kind of. Um, so th this was actually from, from some paper we published where we want to predict whether some materials would be metal or non-metals. Um, and, and then you have to uh, decide what is the, a good uh, figure of merit here. And this uh, figure of made would be, um, uh, for example, the number of misclassified uh, uh, data points, right? So you just uh, try to draw a line here. Again, this is a two-dimensional representation, but typically you have to find this two-dimensional representation. Uh, otherwise, it's trivial. Uh, as a human, you put a line there and you say, OK, except for a few data, I, I have this, uh, this good uh, uh, model. Uh, so it could be this misclassification error. Um, I, I, actually, uh, there are 
more subtle way to, do, uh, to, to, to look into the learning matrix for classification that I will not touch, but just, just to, to, to kind of tell you that, that uh, you, uh, you, it, it is not as simple as for regression to define what is your um, um, metric for, uh, in, in the classification kind of problem. Uh, and even if classification is, um, yeah, maybe more uh, used in, in other than physics uh, kind of applications, still it, it is interesting also for us. And me, here I put some kind of uh, uh, meaningful classification that we could have in physics, for example. Um, okay, um, I am slowly running out of time. <laughs> and uh, I want to say something about, um, Okay, I think I will skip this uh, this point on uh, regularization. Uh, what I want to say is about uh, uh, the hyperparameters. Um, it is uh, a concept that uh, arises technically from the way uh, machine learning uh, is uh, is executed, uh, but then it becomes a kind of a bigger class. The idea is that uh, um, you, you try to uh, design uh, machine learning. Um, uh, um, models that are easy to train and, uh, and then you would have parameters that are not as easy to train and then you call them hyperparameter. So let's make it and make an example. Let's say that you want to uh, uh, model some data as a sum of Gaussians, right? So this, uh, this would be uh, some Gaussian that is centered on some uh, of the data points um, that has some width and, and then you want to learn these uh, uh, coefficients here. So the, the, these di are given, but these are your data points. And what you want to learn are these coefficients here. So if you want to learn the coefficients of this linear expansion over, over Gaussians, it's a linear problem. So you are happy to find these uh, CI coefficients uh, in a, in a um, easy to implement way, let's say. But then you have the width of these Gaussians that is uh, uh, non-linear because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something that, that you cannot fit uh, at, at the same time. So this it would be an example of hyperparameter. And then you can start interpreting, yeah, the width of the Gaussian has some meaning because if the data have some intrinsic noise or not, I want to model that in, in, in that way or not. Um, so technically what, what, what people do is to, to uh, kind of guess, for example, the, the, some value for sigma, uh, and then train different model. Each of them will get the set, set of coefficients. And, uh, and then you look for which value of sigma is uh, uh, you get a better model. And, and if you are very quick in, in reading equations, uh, you would notice that there is no i in sigma. So there is a sigma that is uh, equal for all the basis function. And if you really want to, uh, to be nasty, you can uh, have each Gaussian with a different uh, width and try to fit them separately. But being a nonlinear problem, beware. Um, OK, this is uh, what, exactly what I said, but uh, uh, I, I want to be short here. OK, in any case, you will get the slides. Um, now. Um, when we look at, at, at results of, uh, of regression and we, that we have fit on some, uh, say, root mean square error, we may want to look into something more than, 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 than this uh, uh, root mean square error in order to assess how good is our model. Uh, for example, there are other uh, interesting indicators that are uh, the, the, the mean absolute error and, and some um, uh, statistics of the distribution of error themselves. So graphically, we, we understand better. Uh, let's say this is some prediction that we made with some, uh, uh, for some model that we developed in my group. Uh, the, the important point is looking at all these complex uh, 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 objects here. So we make a prediction uh, uh, and, and we analyze uh, the goodness of the result, right? Uh, for each uh, value of some uh, parameters. And then we have these uh, uh, objects here that are called uh, box plots in which we say, okay, we have uh, some kind of root mean square error that is the square here, but then we also mimic or uh, report the distribution of errors that we had like uh, uh, we go from uh, the, 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 the fifth to the 95th percentile of the error. So you see that the distribution, you can picture 
as being centered, uh, uh, so as the median is somewhere here. And, and so you have, a, say, a lot of error that are concentrated in this area here and few errors that are here, and then probably there will be few data points outside. So when reporting um, results from regression, it is very important, I believe, and not only me, uh, to say a little bit more than just the, 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 the center of, of your distribution. And even more informative are these uh, so-called violin plots. I guess you understand why they're called violin. And the idea is that you uh, reproduce the whole uh, distribution of, of error. So you can see if there is some anomaly in the distribution of your uh, error. Here they are not symmetric because one is training and one is a test. More commonly people make them symmetric and they really look like violin or youth or other kind of instruments, uh, uh, depending on the actual shape. Um, for classification, uh, we have different kind of ways to analyze the results. And, and this is what is called the confusion metric metrics. So we are typically, if you have only two classes, you want to check uh, if you have made, uh, uh, so you want, you have predicted something to be positive and, uh, and it was actually positive or negative and actually neg uh, negative here and, 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 and the kind of uh, uh, wrong predictions. Uh, I guess uh, after COVID and all the tests that you've done, you are very, very familiar with the, with the false positive and false negative uh, kind of thing. I think uh, first time I gave this lecture <laughs> with these uh, slides, uh, this was not so famous. But in any case, um, uh, we, we typically want to, to assess how many times uh, we are wrong and, and, and why, because the, 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 the false negative and the false positive are very com different uh, impact, right? So uh, if you're predicting that, that the material is, uh, is a metal and it isn't, um, uh, it could be that, that then you waste resources because you say, make this material, it turns out that it's not, uh, it's not a metal. And so it's one kind of problem. The other problem is that, okay, I'm not wasting resources, but, uh, um, sorry, that was the false positives, of course. So you predict that it is a metal, but it is actually not a metal. You waste resources. The other kind of uh, error is that you didn't predict that something was a metal, so you don't tell to produce, and, uh, and, and then you have uh, kind of, uh, you have wasted the uh, knowledge in the sense that you, you didn't find something that you were after. So uh, both kind of, Errors are problematic, uh, and, but they have different impact. Okay, then there is some kind of the definition of, of things that are um, uh, related to, uh, to this kind of errors. Okay, 10 minutes. Then I have um, a quick uh, crash course on unsupervised learning that I particularly like. Uh, you let me know if you are can follow. Um, so the idea here is to find a uh, structure in, uh, in the data without labels. So let's say that you start from your data points. On the, on the left, uh, you have uh, a representation of, of, of the data that you could have in, uh, in, in, in the as they are in the database, right? So you have data points one, two, and three uh, up to N, and they are represented by a certain set of uh, features of, of, of variables. And then mathematically, you can always uh, do a matrix decomposition, and you say that you identify a few dimensions uh, such that you map your data points uh, into a representation that is low dimensional, such that each data point is a linear combination of uh, what they're called prototypes or archetypes. So mathematically, this is always possible to do. Um, so this would be that, that each line in, the, in, in your database would be actually represented as a linear combination of some kind of uh, uh, prototypes that have been chosen in some way. It could be that you fancy that they exist or they can be found independently by some machine learning method. Um, so the, 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 the key point here is that uh, you can always do this, this decomposition. The, the equal value um, holds only when intrinsically here, uh, the dimensionality of the data is, uh, is uh, less than the number of features. So technically they're called low rank. Uh, data with respect to the presentation. Uh, otherwise, you have an optimization problem uh, where you say that your 
uh, data are represented by this uh, matrix decomposition in the best possible way, so you have a small error, as small as possible. Um, and the, uh, the beauty of this uh, general representation is that depending on how many dimension you have, uh, you uh, end up in different um, type of unsupervised learning. Um, so if you use as many dimensions as you need to minimize your error, so you basically do not put any constraint, you have a dimension reduction. In particular, you would have a linear kind of dimension reduction, but imagine that your data are somewhat uh, in the high dimension space and there is a low dimensional uh, manifold here, a plane that uh, somewhat goes through the data and explains more, most of them. So this is uh, uh, one way one can find structure in the data, meaning that uh, if you are in the 3D space, actually you realize that, actually the method realized that they live on a narrow, uh, uh, membrane in this, uh, in this kind of um, uh, high dimensional representation. And then you could start asking what happens at the, at the dimension. So what, what are actually the dimensions on the, on the axis here? Uh, now you would, if you start saying, yeah, look, I don't want as many dimensions as, as, as I can get mathematically. I just want to focus as a few, to the smaller number of dimension, you start adding constraint to your minimization and, and, and you technically sparsify the, the representation and you look at, at a good compromise between number of dimension that you need to uh, express your data uh, and the error that you do in uh, uh, reproducing them. Uh, it turns out that the uh, extreme situation in which you have only one dimension explaining the data, what would happen? That in this expansion, actually this should be, ah, okay, I see it, it's back on my screen uh, here. So this expansion uh, would have only one entry. So you're just saying that your um, uh, data point is actually uh, es expressed only by one uh, dimension in your in your space. This is now becoming clustering all, all of a sudden. So you're saying that everything that you need to know uh, about your data is expressed by one uh, um, uh, archetype uh, that is typically the center of the cluster. Um, so basically by tuning the number of dimensions, you, you move from one thing that is typically called um, dimensional reduction to another uh, uh, class of uh, methods that is called uh, clustering, but they are actually uh, uh, um, kind of a sister uh, kind of a kind of approach. They are all, they have all the same uh, in common that you want to represent your data with the, the smallest number of dimensions that you want. And you uh, give the uh, heavy lifting to this uh, representation of the archetypes because the archetypes so this this well, business function essentially have the same dimensions of the initial uh, representation, right? So every, they carry all the information. You compress the information into the archetypes, and then you can ideally reconstruct the whole information. And this, in principle, gives a better understanding of the data. Okay. Now uh, I had I have one slide on, on reinforcement learning, but uh, uh, on, on in, in this direction, uh, Bjork is is, is explaining. Uh, hopefully, uh, much in detail. So I will uh, I will go to the next thing. And uh, what I wanted to say uh, that that uh, one, one can complicate this this machine learning classes uh, at will because many people will say that actually there is a, a further class of adversarial uh, of, of of learning that is different from all the others. That is uh, the, the the adversarial uh, generative uh, modeling. But again, here is uh, is, is a platypus kind of thing in which you can go on forever. Uh, but I, I I try to be a little bit schematic in order to to uh, 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 give an understanding. Um, so now quickly I, I I lay down a little bit of a list of. Uh, uh, applications of uh, uh, um, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence in, in material science. So broadly speaking, um, uh, we have uh, analysis of materials that is prediction of uh, 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 their properties. So more specifically, 
we can try to predict properties of material from just, let's say, the composition or some information about the structure. And it's what is called typically material informatics, in which we, we want to predict properties of material by a compressed information, let's say, about the material itself. Then we would have uh, predicting properties from the configurations. So basically we have access to the, the, the XYZ configuration and, and typically from an ensemble of configurations, we would like to uh, evaluate properties. This is the realm of surrogate models. So typically in physics, we would have our good uh, models to predict properties and we want machine learning to speed up uh, the prediction of the properties. This is actually a very rich industry. Uh, you will hear uh, uh, many talks about uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular aspect um, of, of machine learning is very well developed. And, and uh, the, another uh, part of analysis is not specifically predicting a property from, from, from say some description of the material, but actually trying to interpret automatically some, uh, uh, some measurements. So there is a lot of uh, uh, work uh, in interpreting say microscopy data in, in which you have a set of images and you would like uh, essentially the same way you have uh, uh, artificial intelligence that, that uh, understands if there are cats or dogs in, in, in pictures, you understand what is the structure of certain material, if there is a, a fracture, if there is a grain boundary or something by just looking, uh, analyzing uh, the, the images. So this is all in this uh, materials analysis. Uh, the other important aspect and probably for many most important is the material design is not disentangled from, from the above one because predicting properties enters the material design. But here we have more clearly trying to uh, uh, design or identify new materials that uh, are different from those that were used for the training. So you could have a kind of structure oriented design as people call it, in which you try to move in a set of materials that have a, a class of material that has similar uh, structural properties. One for all pair of skites, you just move in the pair of skite space and try to find one that has a certain uh, property. Or you could have uh, elements oriented design in which you want to just change uh, chemical composition and predict also the structure and the property. And then you have the holy grail, the inverse design, in which you say, I want the best material for this property or this set of properties. And this is really where um, uh, the uh, field is moving uh, uh, strongly and, and, and fast to some extent uh, in order to um, yeah, design algorithms that uh, explore efficiently uh, the material space uh, uh, when you want to target a certain properties. And, and we will have at least uh, three uh, of the lectures uh, that are dedicated in some sense to inverse design. And then it goes with the challenges. Uh, the challenges that we have in specifically in material science is the fact that typically we start with small data. This is not contradictory to the huge databases uh, that uh, people are, are constructing, including the Fermat databases, uh, database, um, or the NOMAD to be more specific. Um, the point is that yes, you can have millions of, of data points, uh, but they are quite sparse. Uh, in your material space. So typically for whatever application you, you may fancy, uh, you, you may find to have very few data points. So it is uh, crucial to uh, design, improve algorithms uh, that uh, uh, start with uh, very few data points and probably plug in a lot of physical intuition that we have that should not become bias, right? So it's good to have intuition, but it's good also that the algorithm doesn't leave as exactly in that uh, intuition without uh, possibility to challenge the intuition itself. Um, in, in general, in artificial intelligence, uh, people talk about um, reliability and accountability of the prediction. So you want that, uh, uh, that, that uh, it is clear why uh, uh, the artificial intelligence has done a certain prediction. In, in the general public discussion, uh, this accountability is really in the direction of uh, 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 kind of uh, social impact. And this, uh, here I put uh, uh, Asimov uh, laws of, uh, of um, uh, robotics where I just changed the uh, robot into AI because uh, this is more modern. Um, the idea is that uh, 
we want uh, artificial intelligence never to harm humans. <laughs> uh, in, in material science, I would say this is not a huge problem, but still, uh, sometimes defining exactly what you want out of your uh, um, um, investigation is part of the thing that touches the harming because uh, you could harm by just wasting resources, right? So, and then you would like really that it is clear what the artificial intelligence is uh, after. Um, more specifically, th there is a lot of discussion in the so-called interpretability and explainability. Now, I don't want to spend more time than uh, what I uh, have. Um, so, from a strict um, uh, computer science point of view, uh, people call interpretability. Uh, um, so, a model is interpretable when it has few variables, essentially. And you can look into the variables and you say, okay, it depends on this and that variable, and that's it. Uh, this is opposite to say a kind of deep learning uh, model in which you, you would have uh, all possible variables uh, and you know, do know, it's hard to know which ones are more effective, which are less effective. When we go to physics, people start probably with good reason to be a little bit more picky. Uh, you want the, the, the model is interpretable in the sense that you can make physical sense of it. But here, uh, I don't think we, we uh, I would claim we don't have the tools to understand if a model is uh, uh, physically meaningful or not, except by testing it in the good, good old way. So you, you, you find a, 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 an empirical law from the data and you start thinking, well, if this is true, then it should hold that in this different uh, regime, I get uh, this kind of prediction or not. And if you see something that is unphysical, then you start uh, uh, going back and, and correct your model. Uh, I, I notice in, in, when I talk about my particular research that people would like that they see some, some expression and they say, why you get them? Can you get them from first principle? I think this is a little bit too much asking to, to, to machine learning uh, models. We want them to be reliable in the physical sense that is they whatever data you give that have a meaning, you get an answer that, that has a physical meaning. So in, in that sense, uh, the model has fully understood the, the, uh, the, the data space, at least, uh, that is moving, uh, that it, it is moving in. Okay, um, I, I had a couple of slides on interpretability, but uh, I don't want now to spend time on that. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, just, just a summary of what, what will happen, uh, as I mentioned, Many times, Marcus will uh, dig into the, the infrastructure and then connected to what I've been saying, we have many talks uh, about uh, uh, learning with this uh, scarce data, few data points, uh, and then uh, two uh, lectures on, on uh, uh, learning interatomic potential, uh, because it is probably it has been the, the first uh, application of, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, ma ma machine learning and material science. Actually, I, I realized that probably Bjork's talk could uh, uh, belong also to this other one. I would say it, it is learning uh, potentials with few data points, right? Probably is the best way to, to, to describe it, but I wanted to underline the, the scarce data, while the other two tend to be like, provided that we have, you have all the data that you want, what is the best model that you can find? That is a fascinating problem in itself, so that's why you have two lectures there. Uh, on that, I stop. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>